All right, so we come into the third section of our study in politics. And tonight we're going to start talking and talk a little bit more about how socialism brings violence with it at all times. Those bearing the worldview of socialism seek to impose their will on others, as we saw in the philosophy section. Historically, it hasn't mattered who is promoting it or where it is being championed. It always brings violence. The reason for this is that it must take away individual freedom and replace it with control of the state. It must take away property from some and give it to others. It must remove God and the Bible and declare that the state, the government, is the all-benevolent dictator. It incites violence when these freedoms are taken away and people rebel against it. It preaches violence to its adherents when people rebel against it in order to force non-adopters into submission to its will. We're actually watching this take place right now as we're watching Antifa riot, Black Lives Matter riot, where are the police? They're, they're nowhere to be found. Sometimes they're standing five feet, ten feet away from people that are being beaten up by Antifa and the rioters. But on the other hand, we have the government forcing, uh, sending police out and shutting down uh, small groups of people that are gathering because of, uh, even during this time of COVID. So they're, they're allowing the rioters to, to destroy property, to hurt people in the name of, of of, of standing up against, you know, whatever it is they're rebelling against. In other words, they're, they're, just, they're all just uh, trying to uphold the socialist worldview is what they're trying to do. But as soon as the, the average person, the common person who seeks on a daily basis to regularly follow the laws, they say, you know what, I'm going to get together with my family for this for the small gathering. Or maybe I'm going to go to church or, or maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this or do that. Maybe I'm not going to wear a mask in public. Oh my goodness, you cannot do that. The police are sent in. And so we see this forcing, this, this stranglehold that's being placed on the American people by the government while the Antifa and Black Lives Matter groups riot. Recently, Project Veritas with James O'Keefe broke an undercover sting operation into Bernie Sanders' political campaign. And this is during the lead-up to the 2020 um, presidential election while the, while the Democrats were having the runoff to figure out who was going to be their leader, who was going to run for president. And one of Bernie's paid field organizers allowed the curtain to be pulled back a little bit on the planned violence as he spouted off to the undercover cameraman. Here are some of the quotes for him. His name was Kyle Urich. He was the Iowa field organizer for Sanders' campaign. He said, I'm ready to throw down now the billionaire class, the blank media pundits. Walk into MSNBC studios, drag those blank blank out by their hair, and light them on fire in the streets. Kyle Urich suggests that liberal Democrats should be placed in gulags or be put to death. He said, liberals get the blank wall first. Wait a minute. We've, we found that many Democrats are on the side of Antifa, on the side of Black Lives Matter. Why this? Well, it just so happens every time there is a takeover, a communist socialist takeover, people are slaughtered. And even those who carried water for uh, those who are, who are the, the rioters, those who are trying to take over, those who are uh, destroying the society and trying to establish rule, they may have carried water for them. They have been a, may have been a fellow traveler, but you know what? They weren't hard enough. They weren't strong enough to stand and go with those who are rebelling. Yurik said, Yurik said, well, I'll tell you what, in Cuba, what did they do to reactionaries? You want to fight against the revolution? You're going to die for it. Yurik affirms that, quote, free speech has repercussions. There are consequences for your blank actions. You should expect a violent reaction, and you deserve a violent reaction. Wow. This man is filled with hate. His anger is directed in the wrong areas. He is completely sold out to a communist worldview. Bernie Sanders, open communist. He not only wants to get rid of conservatives, this man here, he wants, 
the more centrist left wingers that are not committed to the full revolutionary communism to be killed. He promised that cities would burn if if Trump was reelected. He also said that there are many more who believe like him in Sanders' campaign. You can see more about this on the Project Veritas website. Now, why am I covering this information? We've gone through so much so far. We have to cover this information so that we understand there is a direct and immediate influence on the safety of our lives and our families. We should not live in fear, keeping our eyes on Christ, right? But we have to be wise. We have to know what's going on. Socialism is being forced into the evangelical church, uh, even by para, uh, parachurch organizations like the Gospel Coalition and the ERLC that are funded by wicked men like James Riotti, George Soros, and Zach Exley. We'll talk more about those in the next section. And I know, I'm building up to the religion section. You have to understand all of this to grasp the problems with socialism and why it cannot be brought into the church. But we continue to see violence as an important piece of the puzzle as we look at the godless philosophy of socialism. The socialist movement in America, while being pushed by certain pastors and denomination, denominations, comes at a great cost. Those pastors and churches who may have recently hopped on the, bag, uh, the bandwagon, they may be good men who are trying to apply biblical principles to daily life, but they don't understand exactly what's going on or what the historical backgrounds and ramifications of these beliefs are. The pastors in the early 1900s pushing this movement like Walter Rauschenbusch, who is known as the father of the social gospel, I would argue did not have a high view of Scripture and were Marxists at their core while paying lip service to Christianity. They did not believe in the true gospel. Now I want to read a couple passages from Proverbs as we think about violence as we think about this call to violence and i love i I love just read and read and read but i want to read a couple large portions of scripture here for you this first one is from proverbs chapter one beginning in verse eight he says hear my son your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching for they are graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck my son if sinners entice you do not consent If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. He says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. What is Black Lives Matter promoting? What is Antifa promoting? We hear all these things that we're going to take our stuff back. Stuff they didn't own in the first place. We're going to destroy stores. We're going to take it from these stores because this is what we deserve. Let me jump to Proverbs chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, If you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as if for hidden treasures, then you will understand that the fear of the Lord, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Notice you must be searching for these things and we don't search for these things naturally. We only search for them when we have placed our our faith and trust in Christ and in Him alone for our salvation. When the Holy Spirit comes in and, and makes us into new creatures. 
It says, for wisdom, verse 10, for wisdom will come into your heart. Knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion, discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. It's quite the different picture that we get when we think of Antifa, the rioting of Black Lives Matter, versus what the Scripture calls us to. In light of recent attacks, we see a violence that is attached to the act of leaving God. Some violence in the news, and some of this, uh, when I was writing this probably a year ago, was on the front pages. And you can look on the front pages now almost any day, any given time, and see articles just like this. This first one is from uh, about Andy Ngo, N-G-O, who is assaulted by Antifa. He is a homosexual, politically conservative journalist that was tracking the violence of Antifa and the left. He was reporting on a protest in Portland when he was attacked, and he ended up in the hospital with a brain hemorrhage. No police came to rescue him, even though they were very close by. We see Venezuela, Venezuelan communist dictator Maduro. He was shutting down dissent in his country and sending out death squads to shut people up. The Maduro dictatorship in Venezuela is stepping up the operations of death squads aimed at eliminating all opposition to the socialist regime, El Mundo detailed in a report. Death squads. You don't think this is around the corner if socialism gets put into place? It absolutely is. Many Democrats are promoting violence and assassination of Trump. Comedian Kathy Griffith posed holding what looked like the bloody head of Trump that had been decapitated. Madonna called for blowing up the White House. Antifa literally beats people in the streets. A teacher in a classroom showed a picture of Trump on the wall during class and took a water gun and shot the picture of Trump in the head in front of her class. One rapper did a video intimating the assassination of Trump. A, ma a major play was put on showing the assassination of Trump. We're watching violence escalate and nobody seems to know what to do about it. We have people in positions of power that are either supporting it or allowing it to happen. Remember, the first thing we have to do as Christians is we must preach Christ and Him crucified as the only hope for this world. That's the first place we have to start. And so as we're walking through all of this information, yes, I want you to, to become and understand what's going on with education. I want you to become intimately involved with the education of your children. Yes, I want you to understand what the economic aspects of socialism are. I want you to understand what the worldview aspects of socialism are. I want you to understand what the political aspects of socialism are. And I want you to become involved in each of those areas. But we must keep our eyes on Christ. And we must keep pointing people to Christ as our only hope. Many people are confused by the sudden violence that seems to have sprung up. But if you've been tracking through this whole series, you realize this has been planned all along. This is, this is now the fruition of all the work that has gone on over the last 100 years. There's shootings in the news almost on a daily basis. Democrats are quick to point to guns as the perpetrators of violence. Well, why do they do this? Well, the answer is twofold. First, it pushes their goal to, to eradicate gun ownership so that it is easier to take over, uh, to, to hold power over you and less risky for themselves. This has been the socialist goal of, uh, this has been the goal of socialism and tyrants uh, worldwide, and it's currently one of the goals of the one world government movement. 
Second, it is to keep people from looking too deeply into the actual problems underlying the violence. What's going on in our society? What are the things being taught? How are our children being raised and trained? The fear that is pumped into people's hearts and minds through the media on a daily basis. There's a horrible slaughter that took place in Walmart in 2019 in El Paso, Texas. A racist man, driven by racist ideology, sought to kill as many Mexicans as he could. This man held to some politically conservative views as well as some socialist worldviews. Another slaughter took place outside a bar in Ohio on the same day. The man, the first man, held strongly to left. Uh, I'm sorry, the second man, the one that took place in Ohio, he held strongly to leftist politics and was involved in promoting heinous acts toward women through music that his bandmates claimed was all in fun. The politicians were quick to point to the Texas shooting as the result of rhetoric from Donald Trump, but they are unwilling to say that the Ohio shooting was the result of the rhetoric of Elizabeth Warren, who was one of the 2020 Democratic presidential nominee contenders, even though the shooter was vocal about his support for her. Why is that? It's obviously dishonest. One of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to poke and poke and poke and poke and poke in multiple ways through media, through politics, through education, all these things. And so that eventually when you respond, you've had enough and you stand up to respond, they say, oh, well, look at that. Look at that person getting angry about this. Well, yeah, yeah. We've had, we've had rioting and burning and looting and people getting beat up for how long? But they won't talk about that. They'll cover that up and they'll say, look at you, you vicious person. It's another way that we know, we know that they have no morals on which to stand. They only care about the end result. There's no foundation. There's no moral foundation there on which they stand. They only care about the end result. Rather than looking at the heart and minds of the killers, the gun is quickly blamed. But when there is no God, there is no ultimate punishment. Socialism teaches there is no God and the state is all that matters. After all, the philosophers agree that there is no ultimate meaning in life. Deep down, everyone knows that violence cannot be blamed on an inanimate object. It doesn't matter what the, tool, what the tool is that's used for slaughter. When sinful people desire to murder, they use all kinds of weapons. For instance, in China, back in 2014, there was a, a knife attack where 30 people were killed and over 100 were injured. Guess what? The knives were not to blame. The people were to blame. Knife attacks are common in cities and nations that have taken the guns out of people's hands. We can look at Britain and China for examples that are ongoing. How do we know that the publicity of these attacks are attacks are not driven by care for people, but rather political expediency? How do we know that? Well, because the same weekend that these two mass shootings took place, I just mentioned, it was a typical weekend in Chicago where 7 people were killed and 53 people were injured due to shootings. Do we hear about that? No. This is something that happens week in and week out in Chicago and a number of other democratic, socialist-controlled cities, but nobody bats an eye. These cities are bastions of socialism, but they, they don't want to call out violence because it peels back the bandage called sometimes gun control and shows that rather than the healing foundations, rather than seeking to heal the foundations of violence, it simply covers it up. Sin drives violence. We should always understand that that there are times when violence is called for. It should be applied. If someone is trying to break into your house and to do you or your family harm, then violence is called for to stop evil. The violence perpetrated by socialism, though, is evil and is against God's design. God has allowed for us to defend ourselves. He's laid it out in Scripture. The violence, though, is designed. As we think about socialism, we realize that violence is both organic and instigated. Notice this. Lenin wrote, 
in State and Revolution, this is 1917, he said, the dictatorship of the proletariat will produce a series of restrictions of liberty in the case of the capitalists. We must crush them. Their resistance must be broken by force. There must also be violence, and there cannot be liberty or democracy. All right. Pretty clear and open, right? Uh, Restrictions of liberty for the capitalists. Crush them. Resistance must be broken by force. There must also be violence. Stalin was Lenin's general secretary, and under his regime, detractors were deported or imprisoned in labor camps, and as part of the Great Purge, one million people were executed under Stalin's orders. Is this out of the ordinary for socialism? No. This is the rule. This is the law by which they live. This is what happens. Under Chairman Mao Zedong's revolution, we saw violence carried out as part of his takeover. We understand that the movement was fundamentally about elite politics as Mao tried to reassert control by setting radical youths against the Communist Party hierarchy. But it had had uh, widespread consequences at all levels of society. Young people battled Mao's perceived enemies and one another as Red Guards before being sent to the countryside in the later stages of the Cultural Revolution. Intellectuals, people deemed class enemies, and those with ties to the West or the former nationalist government were persecuted. Many officials were purged, that means killed. Some, like the future leader Deng Xiaoping, were eventually rehabilitated. Others were killed, committed suicide, or were left permanently scarred. You can see uh, also a great book that Rand Paul wrote called The Case Against Socialism. Rand Paul points out in the book that they note varying levels of socialism. In a small quantity, it's just sort of, I threaten you with a fine, but there's no real follow-up. But Senator, Senator Paul goes on to explain, when the government seeks to take away private property by force, that's when violence ensues. He says this, And so the ultimate conclusion of socialism, where you really take people's property, people do resist it and become violent. And that's when you have the gulag, whether it was Stalin or Hitler or Mao, Pol Pot, Maduro, Chavez, Castro, and the list could go on. Doesn't seem to be that there is a benign socialism out there. A benign socialism does not exist. It might be peaceful to start with. As we look back over the last hundred years, right? They wanted to infiltrate society. They want to infiltrate every level level of society and teach their thoughts, teach their Marxist poison to the country. Georges Sorrell, who lived from 1847 to 1922, would have a great effect on the application of Marxist thought in the late 1800s in early 1900s. Ludwig von Mises notes this. He said, Sorrel belongs psychologically to the group of people who dream of action but never act. He didn't fight. As a writer, however, Sorrel was very aggressive. He praised cruelty and deplored the fact that cruelty is more and more disappearing from our life. Do you hear that? Sorrel was deploring the fact that cruelty was more and more disappearing from our life. Sorrell asked of the labor unions a new tactic called Action Direct. It was attack, destroy, sabotage. It was the idea of French syndicalism, which syndicalism is just another word for live revolution. It was the idea of French syndicalism that influenced the most important movement of the 20th century. Lenin, Mussolini and Hitler were all influenced by Sorrel, by the idea of action, by the idea not to talk, but to kill. Are you grasping the ramifications of socialism yet? It's no wonder when people like Hillary Clinton say that half of Trump supporters should be put in the basket of deplorables. Hollywood marketed a film in 2019 originally titled Red State versus Blue State, but now called The Hunt, 
where social elites or blue state Democrats literally hunt deplorable Trump supporters for sport. A number of Hollywood actors and actresses have acted out or called for Trump's assassination. I mentioned a few of them just a minute ago. And then they stand back and point the finger at Trump, claiming him to be a racist and the one who's pushing white nationalistic rhetoric. Obama's former attorney general, Loretta Lynch, called for blood in the streets. She did this in a video for the Senate Democrats. At what point does the average American wake up and realize that the next stage of evolution is more violence until control is wrested from anyone with a conservative or Christian bone in their body, and then the real slavery will begin? Just look at Britain, where they took away guns, and even the police don't typically carry guns. There was a, a cop over there in 2019, stabbed multiple times with a knife, he fortunately had a taser, which also is uncommon for the police to carry, but he was able to stop his attacker. You see, they removed guns and they exerted more control over their people. They were jailing people. They're jailing people now for posts on social media, posts that are against the government, calling the government into account for things that they've done. You see, without guns, people are at the mercy of, of the tyrannical state. And please understand, I'm, I'm not saying that you should be able to use guns in an illegal manner, right? God has placed the government in control. The government carries the sword uh, to punish evil, reward good, right? So there are obviously wrong ways to handle things, wrong ways to do things, but we, have, we do have the biblical ability to defend ourselves. And when we go slaughtering people, obviously uh, the death penalty should be on the table. The government should be able to carry that out biblically and accurately to help to stop crime. Now, to understand a little bit more, I keep giving you a little, I try to, try to give it to you in little bits and pieces, right? To help you understand a little bit more about where this stuff came from. Where did this, where did this organized violence come from? Well, I want to talk about Rules for Radicals written by Saul Alinsky. I'm going to talk about the man as well as a little bit about his writing. He lived from 1909 to 1972. Saul Alinsky was the ultimate community organizer. He would go on to be revered by two of the most well-known community organizers of our time, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Alinsky actually offered Clinton a job at one point, but she declined. Obama would later sit under Alinskyites to learn their organizing ways and then go on and instruct others in the ways of organizing like him. Saul Alinsky was as stable as water. Basically, he did what Alinsky felt like doing and then showed everyone else, else how to watch out for old number one. Daniel Flynn notes that his flexibility to changing tactics rather than rigid adherence to principle was the Alinskyite hallmark of successful activism. In true socialistic and totalitarian fa uh, um, fashion, in Rules for Radicals, Alinsky would say this, the organizers should know and accept that the right reason is only introduced as a moral rationalization after the right end has been achieved, although it may have been achieved for the wrong reasons to achieve the right goals. He should be able with skill and calculation to use irrationality in his attempts to progress toward a rational world. Boy, if we do not see this happening today, the end goal, the end is the goal, whatever it may be, whatever their, their, their desired goal is, that's what they're pushing for. That's what Alinsky would be pushing for. He might have to use all kinds of means and methods to get there. He didn't care. All that matters was where he ended up, if things were going in the right direction. Everyone can assume that what Alinsky meant by the right reason and the right goals were simply whatever he wanted them to be. There could be no absolute moral foundation for this kind of thinking. Another reason a Christian cannot go along with this. This is, the typical, this is typical of the inner workings of socialism as we've seen throughout this study. Daniel Flynn goes on telling us a little bit more. He said, these wrong reasons included violence. 
The subject was too touchy, and to bring it up was to invite misquotation and distortion, von Hoffmann writes in his biography. In private, though, he would say that violence has its uses. This is Alinsky. It did as the head of a CIO goon squad, and Alinsky later boasted of his Depression-era involvement with Chicago mobsters. Wow. Enforcer Frank Nitty, he said, took me under his wing. He told this to Playboy shortly before his death in 1972. He said, I called him professor and I became his student. Nitty's boys took me everywhere, showed me all the mob's operations from gin mills and whorehouses and bookie joints to the legitimate businesses they were beginning to take over. Within a few months, I got to know the workings of the Capone mob inside and out. He coolly crowed in, in about detached discussions of mafia hits with Nitty, telling Hugh Hefner's magazine, I learned a lot about the uses and abuses of power from the mob, lessons that stood me in good stead later on when I was organizing. He was, Alinsky was a communist without ever officially joining the party part gangster without ever officially joining the mafia. In a C-SPAN debate with Saul Alinsky's son at Freedom Fest 2017, Dinesh D'Souza also pointed out that Saul Alinsky learned his dirty tactics by hanging out with the mob. In a series of the interviews that I mentioned a minute ago with Playboy and Harper's Magazine in 1971 and 72, Alinsky said this, From a very young age, I tried to figure out how I could get stuff for free without having to work for it. Now to the Christian, that should smack us upside the head, right? Because just as we've been talking all along with socialism, socialism seeks to get rid of work. We look at the philosophers behind it. We look at Marx. We look at Freud. We look at those guys. They were lazy scumbags. We look at Hitler. I mean, all these guys were lazy scumbags. This is the essence of socialism. But what does the Bible tell us? 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 and 11, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all. Paul is chastising them, said, Hey, if you don't work, you don't get to eat. 2 Timothy 5, 8, he says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This doesn't mean that we can use uh, immoral means, that we can sin to get things that uh, our family needs. This means that we need to be working and walking in the ways of God. In the debate, D'Souza goes on to explain how Alinsky developed a scam at at the University of Chicago to eat in dining halls without paying. He then held seminars around the university to instruct other students in in how they could also get food without paying for it, thus building his early attempts at community organizing. D'Souza also goes on to explain that later in life, when Alinsky got involved with organized crime, he liked how they were able to shake people down for money and things. He continued to utilize this model as he laid out his rules for radicals. I'd highly suggest watching Dinesh D'Souza's documentary called Death of a Nation. But Alinsky's tactics can be seen utilized today in, by Obama, enforcing things like Obamacare onto the nation when he was president. He and Hillary uh, proceeded to shake down the insurance companies and the American people in order to gain governmental power over that part of the economy. And we see organizing being taught in our colleges and universities all across this land. Let's talk a little bit about Antifa, which stands for anti-fascist. Trevor Loudon does a great job in his documentary called Antifa Exposed at laying out some of the history and the tactics of Antifa over time. Basically, the group known as Black Bloc from the early 2000s came back as Antifa, and Bloc is spelled B-L-O-C. They originally protested the Iraq War through violence and property destruction. Today, as 
communities deal with the destruction caused by the extremist groups like Antifa, who are neo-Nazis, and the KKK, I'm sorry, Antifa, neo-Nazis, and the KKK, we hear that police are refusing to step in over and over again. An example of this was in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the riots of 2019, where the racist KKK and the fascist Antifa and Black Lives Matter groups were there protesting each other and the removal of a statue. There were, there were other people that were not KKK and that were not Antifa or Black Lives Matter there protesting the removal of the statue. The police actually seem to have had a hand in pushing the two forces together. So these two violent forces, it appears that the police actually funneled them together to cause more harm, more rioting that takes place. You can read about, the L- read about this from the LA Times and the Atlantic. They report about this in, in great detail. The claim is that Antifa is anti-fascist, right? Uh, to some, this sounds great because they hate Nazis. What they don't realize is that this is the same ideology as Nazism, but with a little twist. It's socialism, but it's the communist brand. So yeah, they hate fascists, but they're communists. <laughs> they're not good guys running around seeking to help society. They're seeking to overthrow it. Antifa actually comes from what happened in Italy and other factions of socialist countries in the 1920s. You have the fascists, the Nazis, and the communists all fighting each other. These tactics would later spill over into labor unions in America as pro-communist union members fought with anti-communist members. Leon Trotsky, one of the leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, actually formed the first groups of armed agitators that went out and fought with Nazis. Their numbers were growing in Germany leading up to Hitler's reign, and they regularly fought with the Nazis. Today, it's the same group. Today, Antifa still uses some of the original symbols from 100 years ago. And remember, these are all just different facets of socialism that are fighting each other. F.A. Hayek, have used him several times throughout the study. He says, it is true, of course, that in Germany before 1933 and in Italy before 1922, communists and Nazis or fascists clashed more frequently with each other than with other parties. They competed for the support of the same type of mind and reserved for each other the hatred of the heretic. But their practice showed how closely they are related to both the real enemy, the man with whom they had nothing in common, and whom they could not hope to convince, is the liberal of the old type. He says, well, to the Nazis, the communist, and to the communist, the Nazi, and to both the socialist, are potential recruits who are made of the right timber, although they have listened to false prophets. They both know that there can be no compromise between them and those who really believe in individual freedom. What Hayek is saying is that they're all essentially the same with slight variations. The Nazis stopped Trotsky's Antifa shock troops, and many of them easily converted over to the Nazi party. Loudon recounts that over 50% of the Brown Church were converted Antifa, or communists, from Trotsky, and they called them beefsteak Nazis because they were brown on the outside and red on the inside. Brown shirts, communist red, right? Continuing in Loudon's documentary, Antifa's next iteration in Germany came in the 1980s as they protested Ronald Reagan, and they called themselves the Anonymous. Loudon points out that Antifa, the communists who hate the, the, the fascist Nazis, right, rose up again in the 1990s and called themselves the Anti-Nazi League to combat the Nazis that had begun to rise again. For Antifa, they're not just fighting the fascist Nazis, but they're also fighting anyone who is against their brand of socialism. In German intelligence reports, they actually note that Antifa is fighting against the capitalist system and its supposed fascist roots. He shows a a screenshot in his documentary from German intelligence document. It says, in fact, the true focus is is on fighting the free democratic basic order which is defamed as a capitalist system 
and whose allegedly innate fascist roots are to be eliminated. Again, we have this seeking to destroy capitalism, the association with the West, Christianity, they have to get rid of these ideas. They want to get rid of these ideas and implement socialism, whatever variety, communist, fascist, Nazi, right? That's their goal. Antifa has regrown throughout Germany and greater Europe. There are whole towns today that are devoted to communism and are known as Antifa-ruled towns. Many of America of the American Antifa movement came out of the anarchist movement. They want complete lawlessness. Paul, writing in Romans, tells us clearly that God has established government to rule over people, to punish what is wrong, and to uphold what is right. As we're thinking about what is right, people fighting for what is right, what is true, what is just, without the Bible, the word right moral, it has no context. Without the Bible, there is no ultimate authority as to who determines what is right or wrong. Every other religion falls on its face trying to promote a deity or belief system that cannot fully account for the problems and solutions in the world. But the Bible does it over and over again. We must stand on it. We must love it. We must read it. I want to kind of close out this section, the whole political section, with a couple of profiles. I want to talk about Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton as just a couple more examples of what we've already been talking about, just to show you how deeply embedded these thoughts and ideas are in the American culture at this point, this time in history. There are many people that I could add but as we talk about 21st century, obviously these are two big players. Uh, Bernie Sanders ran for president in 2016. He's attempting to run again in 2020, right, through the, through the Democratic Party. He was a senator from Vermont um, since 2007. He's been in politics almost his entire life. Uh, I, I don't actually know of a job that Bernie Sanders has ever held outside of politics his entire life. He might have had one. I don't know. I wasn't able to find it in my research. You may be able to find it if you're looking for that. He went on his honeymoon in 1988 to Russia with the intent to set up a sister city to Burlington, Vermont, where he was the mayor. Bernie, in true socialist fashion, is known for being lazy. At one point, he was kicked out of, get this, he was kicked out of a hippie commune for being lazy and not carrying his share of work. Now, how lazy do you have to be to get kicked out of a commune with other people that are known for being lazy? Well, he did it. Notice the similarities between Bernie, Karl Marx, and Saul Alinsky. They're all lazy. While, reaching, while preaching utopia, they live off of other people's money. Bernie has never found a communist regime that he was not willing to defend. Matthew Vadim recounts some of Bernie's communist bedfellows. He says, Bernie has long believed in the doctrinaire drivel he has been spouting since he was mayor of Burlington, Vermont. He displayed a Soviet flag in his mayoral office and in 1985 visited Nicaragua to celebrate the 6th anniversary of Daniel Ortega and his Marxist-Leninist-Sandinista government's rise to power. According to Ames Cliff Kincaid, in the 1980s, Sanders collaborated with Soviet and East German peace committees, whose aim was to stop President Reagan's deployment of nuclear missiles in Europe. He also openly joined the Soviets' nuclear freeze campaign to undercut Reagan's military buildup. But now, courtesy of the Occupy movement, which has destigmatized certain aspects of the Marxist faith, people no longer laugh at Sanders when he waxes ignorant on his worldview. It doesn't stop there. <laughs> Holding to his communist ideology in the 1970s, Bernie called for the nationalization of most major industries. That means the government would own the industries. In 1985, he held a lengthy interview where he praised 
Cuban dictator Fidel Castro and slammed then President Ronald Reagan as a liar. He actually praised bread lines under communist regimes when he said this. He was, asked, he was being asked about bread lines in Nicaragua and his support for the Sandinistas. He said this. It's funny, sometimes American journalists talk about how bad a country is that people are lining up for food. That's a good thing. In other countries, people don't like, line up for food. The rich get the food and the poor starve to death. He's talking about an ignorant statement. They're having to line up for food, Mr. Bernie Sanders, because there is no food to get. The rich have already taken it, and the scraps that they're allowing the people under them to get are barely enough to stay alive. about someone whose head is stuck in the sand, who's unwilling to see the problems, while he's claiming to care about people, right? He attempts to distinguish his socialism from the bad aspects of these other socialist regimes, but as we have seen, socialism always ends up to be totalitarian, and violence will always be required to take away property from those who own it. He now claims to be a democratic socialist, in the vein of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. However, Rand Paul laid out a beautiful case for this in his, in his book, The Case Against Socialism. He destroys the idea that these countries, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and you'll hear this all the time if you're listening to the news, you'll hear, you'll hear uh, Bernie talk about it, you'll hear others talk about it. These countries are not socialist. They have aspects of socialism. They've uh, adopted some aspects of socialism, but they are, they are, they're trying to bring it in with their capitalism. They are very capitalist nations. So Bernie Sanders is absolutely lying. Anyone is absolutely lying when they're calling these nations socialist nations. Now, they may end up getting there, right, with some of the things they've adopted. But he is definitely not a democratic socialist in the vein of these countries. And it's always funny when somebody adds the word democratic onto the front of socialist. It's the same thing, Right? You can't put lipstick on a pig. I guess you can. It just doesn't help anything, right? Uh, Hillary Clinton, all right? Hillary Clinton was deeply affected by communists in her college years, yes? Those formative years. This is why it's so critical that young people, as you go away to college, as you think about where you're going, you prepare your heart and mind. First of all, do I really need to go to college? What college am I going to? And how do I defend against these ideas, right? You're going to hear everything that is anti-God, anti-Scripture. They're going to tear Christianity apart over and over again. I've been leading youth group, I, th I think I've told you this before, but been leading group, youth group for over 15 years, and I'm amazed at how many uh, students will come back years later and tell me, you know, you were, you were telling us about this, but I had no idea. I had no idea it would be this bad. A lot of parents will think, oh, well, you know, it wasn't too bad when I was in school. Well, guess what? You were in school 20, 30, 40 years ago. It was bad. You just might not have noticed it. It's way worse today. Way worse today. She was deeply affected by communists in her college years. Communism touched her so deeply that she changed from being a Republican to a Democrat in less than four years. Discover the Network's great website tells us about this transformation. They said Rodham was deeply influenced by a 1966 article titled Change or Containment, which appeared in Motive, a magazine for college-age Methodists. So obviously, this magazine was already taken over by the socialists. Authored by the Marxist-Maoist theoretician Carl Oglesby, who was a leader of the Students for a Democratic Society, this piece defended Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, and Maoist tactics of violence. Its thesis was that certain cultural settings, most notably American capitalism, were inherently inequitable and oppressive. What, what about Ho Chi Minh? What about Fidel Castro? Right? And thus... He called people to feel pain and rage that sometimes erupted into violence, like that of the rioters in Watts or Harlem, which was reactive and provoked rather than aggressive or malicious. 
we're hearing the same argument today. Oh, well, Black Lives Matter, it, it's, it was provoked by white people, those racist white people. It, it's not aggressive or malicious. That's what we're being told. But as we understand, the history of socialism it is absolutely aggressive and malicious. Its goal and intent is to destroy and tear down America. It said Hillary later said that the Motive article had played a key role in her meta metamorphosis from Goldwater Republican in 1964 to leftist Democrat in 1968. During her years as First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Clinton would tell a Newsweek reporter that she still treasured the Oglesby, the Oglesby peace. That's almost, that's almost 30 years later, 20, 30 years later. She still treasured that peace. Is something that you write today, will something that you write today help someone, point, to, point them to Christ? Maybe a conversation you have, will it make a lasting impression? That Oglesby peace, that communist peace made a lasting impression on her. She wrote her senior thesis on Saul Linsky and was later offered a job by him. She declined and enrolled in law school but kept close ties with Alinsky. Discover the Networks tells us she also continued to correspond with him as the two maintained a very friendly relationship steeped in mutual admiration. In a letter dated July 8, 1971, Hillary penned a letter to Alinsky that began, Dear Saul, when is that new book, Rules for Radicals, coming out? Or has it come and I somehow missed the fulfillment of Revelation? I have just had my 1,000th conversation about Reveille for radicals and need some new material to throw at people. She was a die-hard socialist, uh, uh, progressive communist at heart. You are being rediscovered again as the new left type politicos are finally beginning to think seriously about the hard work and mechanics of organizing. I seem to have survived law school slightly bruised with my belief in and zest for organizing intact. She was greatly influenced by the Frankfurt School thought and their critical legal theory. She continued, though, to grow and become a, a, more of a Marxist year by year. Discover the Networks continues. Also in 1972, she went to Berkeley to work as an intern at her hand-picked law firm, Truhoft, Walker, and Bernstein, founded by current or former members of the Communist Party USA. This firm had long acted as a legal asset, not only for the CPUSA, but also for the Black Panthers and other Bay Area radicals. Founding partner Bob Truhoft, head of the California Communist Party, had been labeled one of the most, nation's most dangerously subversive lawyers. Do you hear this communist influence in our government? Do you hear how far back it goes? According to historian Stephen Schwartz, Truhoft is a man who dedicated his entire legal career to advancing the agenda of the Soviet Communist Party and the KGB. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great for America, folks. Yeah, these are, these are the types of things I want my children to be learning in school. False. She regularly attacked the family in her work and her writing. Hating America, she had to... She had to attack its foundation, the Christian worldview. She wanted to remove children from the influence of their fathers. She instead advocated for social institutions set up by the state to raise and protect the children. We're told that viewing America as an authoritarian, patriarchal, male-dominated society that tended to oppress women, children, and minorities... Hillary wrote a November 1973 article for the Harvard Educational Review advocating the liberation of children from the empire of the father. We're bearing the result of this right now as our society burns, both figuratively, figuratively and literally. She claimed that the traditional nuclear family structure often undermined the best interests of children who, quote, consequently need social institutions specifically designed to safeguard their position. Along with the family, she elaborated, quote, past and present examples of such arrangements include marriage, slavery, and the Indian reservation system. She added, decisions about motherhood and abortion, schooling, cosmetic surgery, treatment of venereal disease or employment, 
and others where the decision or lack of one will significantly affect a child's future should not be made unilaterally by parents. She wants to destroy the family. Isn't that interesting? Go back to the Ten Commandments that we've been talking about over and over again. Socialism hates the Ten Commandments. They can have no God other than the state. Lying, cheating, stealing, those, those things are all just the means to get what they want. Personal property, there's no personal property. That's all owned by the state according to socialism. Don't covet. doesn't matter. The state owns it all, and they will distribute it as they see fairly, supposedly. The list here could keep going with her radical socialist ranting. Hillary has expressed her love for Margaret Sanger in Planned Parenthood more than once. She accepted an award from Planned Parenthood in 2009. She is so corrupt that she was kicked off the Watergate investigation in the 1970s. That should tell you something. She repeatedly defended her husband against rape allegations, even though they were very credible, even going so far as to allegedly personally threaten at least one rape, vi rape victim into silence. We could go on. We could just pull person after influential person after influential person up. We could look at their lives. Nobody's going to be perfect. Don't ever think that. There's not going to be a perfect person out there. People are going to have maybe a, a, a conflict in their thinking, maybe over here, over there, or contradictions. But when you swallow the idea of socialism, when you buy into that idea, all of this stuff we're talking about comes with it. You personally may not be violent, but oftentimes you're advocating for the violence that's done in the name of socialism, whether it's communism, fascism, Nazism, whatever you want to call it. All of this stuff comes with it. We've gone through in the political section kind of the history, a number of people. We looked at, we looked at Barack Obama. We looked at the Communist Party USA, the Democratic Socialists of America, Fabian Socialism, the Frankfurt School, we, we saw how political correctness, we now call that cultural Marxism. We saw Adorno and his F scale, which stood for fascist scale. We talked about Antonio Gramsci, the violence of socialism, Antifa, Saul Alinsky, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton. We go on. My goal is to hopefully impart this information to you so that it spurs you to learn more to be more aware of your surroundings, more in tune with what is going on and the ways that Satan is seeking to destroy the Christian worldview, the way he's seeking to undermine your thinking in every area. When we're called into uh, walking with the Lord. We, we heard in Proverbs as Solomon calls his son, listen, my son, seek wisdom, seek understanding. Don't lie in wait to shed innocent blood. These are things that should keep our hearts and minds focused on Christ. Understanding of the gospel. Preaching the gospel and not confusing it with something like social justice or critical race theory. This is what we're going to jump into in the next segment as we go through the religious aspect of socialism. And we see how it has infiltrated the church. We're going to see how it is present day, and we're going to look back 100 years and see how it came into the church. So we need to be on our guard, and we need to be ready, right? Fighting dragons with shouts of joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. Lord, as we think of how socialism seeks to upend and tear up your, uh, your teaching, the call for us to live with, with a fear of you while understanding your love. Socialism seeks to replace you with themselves, whatever that government may be, whatever that governing body may be, whatever tyrant that may be. They have no room for you. There's no possible way to allow you into their world, so they must uproot you and dig you out of any system that they find. I pray, Lord, you would help us to be rooted deeply in you so that we cannot be uprooted, 
so that we are ready for the onslaught uh, of the world, the onslaughts of Satan, Lord. Help us to, whether, whether we are meek and mild or, or ready for a fight, Lord, help us to understand when and where to stand up. Help us to know how to stand up, what to say, how to do it. We know that we are called to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of you. I pray that you would help us to do that and give us wisdom in the process. We thank you. We love you. Go with us now. It's in your name we pray. Amen.